I'm just kidding. This is not uh, a 2008 um, tutorial on how to like pirate Adobe Premiere or anything. People were really interested in my touch portal stuff, specifically this button right here, which is the one that makes all the comic bubbles go away, or the words on the comic bubbles go away. Um, so I figured I would make a video going over all of my touch portal buttons in a more detailed, oriented way. Um, it's just going to be a really chill, relaxed video. Uh, so sit back, grab a Coke, grab some snacks, and let's get technical. Okay, so this is my home screen on Touch Portal. Uh, everything is kind of like organized in clusters, um, and we're gonna go through them one by one. Uh, starting with, with this cluster, the bottom right cluster, which is like my streaming cluster. So let me open Streamlabs here. Um, all of these buttons, with the exception of these two, are basically scene switchers. So if I press, you know, this one, it goes to the primary monitor. This is the secondary monitor. Um, it's actually like weirdly broken right now <laughs> because that's my third monitor, not my second monitor, but whatever, it's fine. Um, this one goes to this scene, which is just if I'm playing a 4-3 game. Um, and then this is full screen camera. Then, you know, this is a be right back screen with the chat and everything. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is just, you know, touch portal integrated, um, uh, API stuff. Like I can open touch portal here and you can see these buttons. There's nothing fancy going on. Um, well, that's a bad e example. I'll get to that in a second. There's nothing fancy going on. It's just, um, you know, a scene transition. Now you noticed, if you noticed here, when I do click them and it transitions, when I click them, they turn blue over on touch portal. That is something a little fancy. Uh, that's just an aesthetic thing. I made all of these icons and I wanted to like have a visual representation of when I'm on that scene. Um, so that's just a quick, like, uh, thing that's an on event event in touch portal. This isn't a tutorial. I'm just giving you some ideas of how you can use touch portal if you want to go and use it yourself. Um, but yeah, so those other two buttons that I left out, uh, the one of them, if I could bring Streamlabs back up, uh, this one is a record button, so it just starts and stops record, it's just a toggle. Um, that, I made that just because I was doing Starbound stuff, uh, for the Starbound video I was recording uh, a bunch of stuff, so I needed a way to quickly do it, um, without tabbing out of the game. Um, and then this one here, this last one, is, let me bring up Discord here to show it. It is a Discord, uh, thing. Yeah, so here's Discord. All it does is it deafens and undeafens me. Um, I have this here in the streaming quadrant uh, because I, you know, if I ever want to talk to chat and I don't want to bother the people that I'm uh, on Discord with while I'm streaming or just in general, if I'm talking to people on Discord, and I have to go pee or something. I'll just deafen myself. Uh, it's, it's quick and it's dirty. And it's a good thing. Also, pro tip, uh, if you're ever playing like a multiplayer game that has voice chat, bind your push to talk uh in the game to the same button as a push to mute in discord so whenever you're talking in like team chat in the game to talk to like the randoms your your friends that are on discord with you don't have to hear you twice uh because who ever wants to hear you twice uh yeah so that's kind of the streaming quadrant of my home screen we're gonna move up here to this quadrant the top right which is is audio stuff. Hey, so I had some technical issues while I was recording this where uh, desktop audio was being fed through weird parts. You'll um, hear the effects of that later, but also it didn't record um, the demonstration of these two buttons. So long story short, uh, this button just switches the audio output from my headphones to uh, my speakers and this button boosts the audio of any music I'm playing by six decibels. That's all done through voice meter, um, and I, I think I talk about that, so, so here's the voice meter explanation. I use a program called voice meter, which is, it's this nightmare. I use the potato version. There are smaller versions, but I needed this one because I needed this many tracks. It's basically a virtual audio mixer uh, that lets you treat software as hardware inputs uh, so what you can do is like a like an actual use case for this is if you're streaming or if you're recording a video for posts like a let's play or something um, and you have like 
you know, music playing, there's audio coming from the game, and there's audio coming from your microphone, and there's also, like, you're talking to friends, so there's audio coming from Discord. What Voice Meter lets you do is treat all of those sources as individual sources instead of just, you know, uh, if, if you were recording without Voice Meter and set up in this way, uh, it would treat, you would have desktop audio and microphone. That's two tracks. That's it. So, uh, if, if, if your friend says something funny, um, but it's like drowned out by the gameplay audio, there's no way without like fancy dynamics processing to really bring that up without bringing the gameplay audio up with it. But you can do that if you record all of them separately or something cool you can do with this as well is, uh, through OBS, you can play music through your, to your stream without playing it to yourself. So, like, if you're playing a game or you're focusing on something, I've done this where I'm focusing on an edit and I can't really listen to music because it'll uh, distract me. But I know the stream would be more entertaining if there was music playing in the background. So, I'll play music in the background for them through OBS, but it's muted for me. Um, so, and that's just done by, like, I could click mute here on the music tab where Google Chrome is in. Uh, and Discord is in, like, all of these discord like it's it's weird uh it, it works in the way that i that i want it to but like i don't know why it's it's all set up like this but anyway um i can mute it there but then not have it muted in in obs because it's treating it as as a different source so this this vio 3 that's a that's an audio source that you can select in your playback or recording devices um so you tell Streamlabs that it's not muted but then you just mute it here like you would on a mixer and it goes to Streamlabs, but it doesn't go to your headphones um, or your speakers or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I've done that before. There's a lot of good use cases for that. So how these buttons work is if I, I can click them again, you can see what's happening on voice meter. So I clicked that and what happened was it muted this output, which is the headphones and it, uh, or it unmuted that one, which is the speakers and it muted the first one, which is headphones. It just switches between them. Um, I can bring up touch portal here and, oh, it's right there. Uh, and you can see that all it's doing in touch portal is pressing a keyboard shortcut and changing the thing. Um, the reason for that is because voice meters, touch portal plugin API integration, isn't that great. It doesn't work all the time. So I use, um, macro buttons, which is, it's called voice meter remote. Uh, it's just buttons that you can use for, for, um, macros and they're, they're programmed like this. Um, and then I just tell touch portal to call the keyboard shortcut that does that so for the swap output thing is control numpad zero um, and then the music boost is control numpad was that i don't know what that is what the hell what is, oh numpad multiply that is a very archaic keyboard shortcut anyway um so yeah what that's doing is it's just it's boosting when i click it it boosts my uh my music channel here voice meter is really intimidating to get set up the first time but once you understand how it works especially if you've worked with physical mixers before and you just start treating software as physical devices in your head then it gets a lot easier to understand but it is a really daunting software to get to but i recommend it if you're a streamer or if you just want more uh, control over your audio um, without having to turn a bunch of knobs and stuff, uh, especially because my speakers are like way back there. I don't want to move back there and turn them, and I don't I don't want to mess with my my um, my headphone audio because, like I said, I have it set at a very specific point or part point port. Who cares? Anyway, that's that quadrant up there. Took a lot uh, to explain, even though it's just two buttons. Um, so next quadrant this one is is a uh, brain dead simple to explain so these two buttons are or these two buttons i don't know why i was pointing that one all they do is open uh, my work folders for comic story and and uh orms corner this the place you're watching this video on uh that's all they do that's just a touch portal thing so if you open them all it is is open folder that's a native touch portal thing so uh if you're wondering how i have uh these tabs how i have tabs on my on my windows explorer here i use a, a program called clover which is kind of is kind of a sketchy program but it adds chrome style tabs to your uh to your thing so that's great get it if you want there are other there are other like more updated um versions to add tabs to windows explorer but they don't look as good 
they don't just look like chrome tabs and i wanted them to look like chrome tabs so like a lot of them were made for like windows xp and shit so they look old and they <laughs> they're not programmed by people who care about aesthetics i guess which, which is fine but uh yeah so anyway this last button on here um it's just a page switcher uh when you click it it goes to the work page which is the second page which is far more intimidating which we'll get into again that is uh, by design a native touch portal thing so just go to page that's all that does so this next page is a lot more complicated uh, we're gonna get to them one by one uh just quickly gonna explain this top quadrant the top left quadrant you already know what those three buttons do they're just a copy and paste um of the buttons on the previous page this arrow all it does is it takes you back to the home page um so yeah that's the top left quadrant bottom left quadrant is a, a little more interesting um uh there's a third folder here this folder is just the sound effects folder or my my sound effects folder which has anywhere from like actual useful sound effects to uh stupid things like fart sounds and i don't know here's the splinter cell night vision goggles sound effect i just throw like literally any sound that i find in here just in case i need to call back to it um i also have some sound effects libraries that i've downloaded um just so slowly over time i've been building up my own sound effects library so i don't have to go and download a new sound effect every time it's very helpful one row below that is something that you will notice a trend with with the rest of these buttons is me adding functionality into the programs that i use every day that it doesn't make sense that they don't already have um so these two buttons it kind of would imply that they open uh, i work on templates a lot i work with templates a lot so it would imply here that this one opens the Orms Corner Premiere Pro template, and this one opens the Comic Story in Premiere Pro template. And that's correct. But what it also does, so if I click the Orms Corner one here, it opens it, and then if it works, sometimes it doesn't work, especially if I don't have Premiere highlighted at the time or if it takes a while to, to, um, to load. Yeah, it didn't work that time. <laughs> but theoretically i could fix it it just uh, this is another thing where muscle memory i haven't used it enough to get it down but what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to open the program and then immediately hit Control shift s after it's open so that i don't accidentally start working on a template and save it and then have to go back and and remake my template the thing that i think premiere should have that i don't understand why it doesn't have is a template system where you just change the file type and when you open it, it opens uh, like a new version, just an untitled version. And that's what all of these Photoshop buttons do, which I'll get to in a second. They're, they're, they have Photoshop has a template system, but uh, Premiere doesn't. Um, so I tried to add that feature in through Auto Hotkey, which I can show you my uh, script for. Okay, so yeah, this, this, is, this is it right here. This is the Premiere template opener. I wrote this myself. It's very impressive, I know. <laughs> All it does is it does a run wait command, um, which that's why it doesn't always work because I run it like worked at first and it works if it opens the program really quickly. Um, but realistically, I should probably add a bunch of sleep commands in here um, before it sends the control shift S. But that's why it sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. And that's probably why I haven't like a fixed muscle memory to do that. But uh, I just always try to remember to save it as a different name beforehand. But please adobe please add this feature in you already have it in photoshop just add it in premiere just let me mark a, a program as a uh a, a, a template and my voice just cracked a template uh, so that i can don't have to mess up my template at any point um anyway moving on down to this quadrant the low well the bottom row these bottom two rows um i'm just gonna get this one out of the way all that does I'm not even going to show you. It doesn't matter. It just opens my Orms Corner thumbnails uh, folder, which I always forget is there. I should use more because that's actually helpful. The, the rest of those, the these, the, the five other ones. This is what I was talking about with um, Photoshop templates. Photoshop does have a template system. If you didn't know that, it's very helpful. Um, and these are all my thumbnails. So I can just quickly click here, the Orms Corner thumbnail template, and it'll bring it up. And I have it just like the Premiere one. It immediately hits uh, Control Shift S. Um, it just needs to be Control S because Photoshop has this, but it just lets me um, find where I need to put it and name it like right away uh, instead of accidentally saving over the template. I don't even need to do that though because Photoshop has a template thing. So if you if you change your file extension to be .p 
.psd t instead of .psd, it changes it to a template file, which all that does is when you open it, it creates a new one called untitled. It's immediately like unsaved. So when you press control S, it's like, oh, where do you want to save this? Oh, and again, um, all of this is pretty simple. Uh, basically, most of the ones on this page through Touch Portal are auto hotkey things. Uh, so if you want to look at the auto hotkey code for that, it's it's this. It's essentially the same code <laughs> as uh, the Premiere template thing. In fact, it is the same. It's just calling upon a different file. Uh, now we get into the the more complicated ones. Uh, we're gonna go top to bottom, starting starting here up at the top in this quadrant. These are a little more complicated. These these first four or these 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 first five in this like quadrant, this top right quadrant, um, they're a little more complicated. Uh, I didn't write this script. I'm gonna show you the script real quick. And uh, these are all auto hotkey, with the exception of like one of them. This big meaty section that's very commented. This is uh, code that I did not write. Uh, in my original video, I talked about Taron Van Hemert, who I was inspired by to do like most of the stuff, Touch Portal stuff, eventually leading up to that. Uh, he wrote this script. Um, it is a script that basically what it does is it um, tells your mouse to, or it tells Premiere to target the effects box, tells your mouse to go there, um, or, or then it types something in, tells your mouse to go a certain like uh, direction down, click and hold and then drag onto the clip it's it's a complicated thing at like face value but once you actually look through the, the through the code here and realize what's happening it's it's a lot easier and the comments help as well because he explains everything yeah so i've i used that code and modified it to control uh five different uh, uh effects presets and he has a, like a shitload of them but these are just the ones that i have so um, th these are b basically all of them are used for uh, for work for the complete story series. Um, so if I have a panel like this, this is usually what a page would look like when I put it in. I just so I just need to hover my mouse over here, and you can kind of see it happening. So so watch carefully. Um, when I click the button, my mouse will kind of. Oops, I didn't actually click at that time. My mouse will like jitter over, type something in real quick, and then um, return to the position. And now. What's happened is I've applied a preset. Now, all this does is, is apply presets. It's a preset applier, basically. Um, and it, technically, you could apply an effect, just like a bare effect as well. You just have to type it in. All it's doing in, in, in layman's terms is it is typing something into the effects box, and then it is pulling out the one the, the top result that comes out when it types that thing in. So I have a bunch of presets. So this one is comic story and full page effects. That's what that means. So it applies it, and what it does is it adds a position uh you know keyframe thing that's just a slow scrolling pan animation it reduces the scale to 75 because generally that is the the scale number sometimes i have to change it uh and then it adds a drop shadow a specific drop shadow that i like to use that just does it everywhere instead of a specific it's not angled um it's not a directional drop shadow so it's more of an outer glow uh, but Premiere's Outer Glow sucks. Now, uh, if you see here, this is just some details on my preset. I'm just explaining everything in a lot of detail just to get your mind working on like how to improve your workflow if you're going to be using this. Um, the reason I don't have it scaled, for those that don't know, if you have keyframes involved in a preset, it gives you an option. So like if I do save preset here, it gives you an option between scale, anchor to endpoint, or anchor to outpoint. Scale will take the first keyframe and the last keyframe and like squash them to fit whatever length you're applying it to. So the first keyframe will go to the endpoint, the last keyframe will go to the outpoint. The reason I don't have it like that, I have it on, um, so like if I control Z here, you can see the last keyframe didn't end up here, it ended up way over here. The reason for that is because I like to have a consistent um, speed to my pans. So if I had multiple pages, like a, like a timeline that looked like this, and I needed to apply all of them, um, uh, I would, but say like this image is too long for this, I would take this keyframe, I would move it down a little bit and then extend it out so that the speed is about the same and then I would control C um, and then paste preferences, I have that set to F, uh, but paste attributes to the rest of them. Just so that they, the, the timing on all of them is consistent. Um, that's a very specific thing to my workflow, but yeah, that's how that works. Um, so for the rest of the buttons, 
they're doing essentially the exact same thing but again they're just specific presets to my needs so this one is called comic story and crop page fx so what this does is it just adds um a, a preset crop thing which this is a this is a a common aspect ratio for when I need to zoom, like crop in on a page. I don't do this in Photoshop for reasons that are very specific to my workflow. Again, it doesn't matter. And then it also applies the drop shadow um, and a scale, like a zoom in, um, just like the pan thing. It's not anchored. It is a specific speed that I will then change. Um, but generally because of the size of pages being so consistent that I work on, I almost never have to change the scale animation or the pan animation. Um, sometimes I'll have to make it bigger if it's longer. Um, like I'll have to do like 130 here instead of 110 if it's longer. But I will apply it to one thing, I'll fix the speed if I need to, and then I'll copy it to everything uh, and change the crop um, when needed. This is, this is a, here's a tip. I learned this from... Um, Used to be an editor, still edits sometimes. Uh, Silu91 on Twitch, check him out. Dan, um, one of my one of my coworkers, I actually learned this from him. I had no idea. Uh, if you click on crop in Premiere in the effects controls panel, you get handles for it, and you can drag them around, and it's so helpful. Uh, like before, I was just doing it by the numbers and stuff, which is which is hell. That's so much better. So if you didn't know that, here's a pro tip for you. Um, so these last these last two buttons that are in this like four square thing, uh, this one just applies my crop shadow or my drop shadow preset. Sorry, the next one is crop shadow. Um, all it is is my specific drop shadow that I like. Uh, so I it, it's really helpful just if I have like some text like like blah 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 I guess, uh, and then quickly I can just click bam. Now it's got the drop shadow that I like. Easy peasy. Uh, last button here. This this is the the, the crop shadow. Um, let me delete the drop shadow here. C I call this crop shadow because it adds a, a default crop and the drop shadow that I like. <laughs> this is also super helpful for very specific use cases. Doesn't matter. Moving on. We're gonna move over to this last this last preset applier. So if I grab some music here, you can tell it has to do with music. Uh, if I grab some music here and play it, I'll just put it on that track. I don't, yeah, because I have some. Anyway. It's pretty loud, right? It doesn't sound like, uh, you know, music that would go in the background of the music. It's like overpowering my voice right now. Um, but if I click this button, it applies what I call the comic story and music effects. The reason it's called comic story, I use this for like every music track, but I created it for the complete story um, on comic story. And so that's what it does. What it applies is it uh, first it, it turns off the keyframe uh, stopwatch for levels and then it uh, drops it down to negative 20, and it also adds this. It adds a, uh, a parametric equalizer. This is called the music notch. Um, I learned about this from Scott Nicewander, uh, Nerd Sync Boy, uh, who learned it from some other video, um, where basically it's just, it is a notch in the frequency of music that, or, or the free, it's a notch that you put in the, fre in the frequency where human speech usually resides. So any instruments that, there, it's usually highs, like really high, like biting instruments, like hi-hats or cymbals and stuff. Those get brought down a bit so that your speech can be heard better. And again, that's something that like normally I would forget to put or be like, there's no time to put that in there. But if it's on a preset, it's just gonna be there and it'll instantly make everything sound better. Um, so now you can tell, instantly, this music is like ready to go. Background music. Um, that's great, that's a good time. So yeah, that's the that's the music preset applier. Also, all of these only work in Premiere. They have the, the, the thing in auto hotkey that says, um, only activate these when pressed if uh, Premiere is the program that's being used. Um, so the only one on this section that isn't um, uh, auto hotkey is this button right here, which all it does is hit control M. Uh, and that is kind of my universal keyboard shortcut for export. And I think that is just basic for most things. I don't remember a lot of my keyboard shortcuts were dialed in years ago. So I don't remember what's default and what's not. Um, but that's what calls upon export for me. So I use this in Audition and in Premiere. I can't show you Audition right now because I'm recording my voice through Audition. Anyway, yeah, that's all that does. And that is native to Touch Portal. Like if I uh, click on it here, see, key press control M. The reason I have that is because 
my idea my my thought process to get ideas for um uh for touch portal keys was twofold the first one was uh anything that takes multiple keystrokes that could be turned into a macro um so things like uh you know opening a photoshop template and then hitting Control shift s or one that we're gonna get to the the one that i showed off in the original video about the comic bubbles stuff like that and the second like kind of methodology i had in my head was anytime i need to take my this hand off of the mouse to reach over to press something on the keyboard so like a keyboard shortcut that requires both hands that would become a button and that's control m like i could reach across like this to hit control m but that's like uncomfortable and not sustainable so normally i would just hit control with my left hand and then m with um, my right hand but it's a lot easier just to reach over with my left hand and and click the button uh so yeah that's it's a it's a really simple one but that's kind of the thought process i was in I was like okay what would make this easier on myself or quicker um and that's what I came up with. Okay, so for these last ones, except for this one, which actually I forgot is a Premiere one, uh, this button, the 2.5X, we'll get to that. It's down here because of a specific reason, because of what it does. I'll talk about that one last, just because it's at the bottom. So for these last ones, I need Photoshop again, so I have uh, this open. I'm just gonna save it as a PSD real quick because that's uh, important for these other commands i'm just gonna use this page from spider woman the, the very the awful the, the new very awful spider woman series i'm gonna talk about that i know some people are asking um when i'm gonna talk about this book i'm gonna talk about it either after it gets canceled or after the first story arc wraps up whichever comes first um but sh long story short i don't like it it's a bad portrayal of jess um and the story's boring and bad anyway these two buttons they a uh, little floppy disk with jpeg and png on them but what these do it's an auto hotkey script that when i click it it uh, but basically brings up the save as window and automatically selects save as type JPEG. Um, and same with PNG, it selects save as type PNG. This one is just a macro. There's no fancy mouse movement going on here. Um, there's probably a smarter way to do this script. This is one I wrote myself. This is probably uh, not complicated, but a lot going on. It's so stupid. <laughs> This is, so they both work differently actually, because one of them had more jankiness than the other. So save as JPEG, what save as JPEG does is it will, uh, it, it moves the mouse. Um, I got to explain. So there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of things behind this code that they're only there because of, um, Photoshop's jankiness and, and bug fixing. Um, but essentially what this is doing is it's moving my mouse away so that the mouse doesn't affect the selection I'm about to make in the, in the save as box. And then it uh, so brings up the save as box. It hits tab. So it goes down into the save as box and then it types J. So J will immediately select JPEG. It'll go to JPEG. And then it moves the cursor back to um it moves the cursor back to the original position so that it didn't so that you know your cursor just ends up back where you found it it's not like teleporting your cursor all over the place and then it does shift tab which goes up instead of down so it like reverses basically so you're back up into the the file name box so you can start typing the file name if you need to change the file name uh, the reason I don't have it like automatically save is because sometimes I want to change the file name if I'm saving as a JPEG or a PNG. So same process with PNG here, except you can see it sends uh, the down button a bunch. Honestly, I don't remember why it does this because it also sends P, um, but it works and it and it's never not worked since I've troubleshooted it. This code is probably awful. <laughs> But, but it gets the job done. It does the same mouse movement thing and everything. Um, so, but, but again, it works. So like you can see when I, when I click PNG, it brings up the PNG and it works. The same with JPEG, brings it up JPEG, bingo bongo. That's what that does. It's just helpful. I do that because normally you would have to hit control shift S and then click and then go down. And then, uh, you know, it's just, it's simpler this way. Um, Again, that is something that Photoshop could remedy by having a keyboard shortcut for save as JPEG or save as PNG. They don't have that as far as I know. Uh, these other two right here, this one I talked about a little bit in the video. This one I didn't. So this is basically just a stripped down version of this one. So I'm just going to get into it real quick. Uh, if I select this right here uh, and then click this button, it's going to bring up the contract selection box. 
the reason I have that is the same methodology behind my export button. Um, the keyboard shortcut, which is not a default keyboard shortcut that I have for contract select, requires two hands or like a really complicated claw. I don't even remember what the keyboard shortcut is. Let's find out. It is alt Control c <laughs> which that's like this. It's like this. I have to do this and I don't like that. That, that hurts. Um, so I guess th I forgot this one's also not auto hotkey. This just is a Photoshop command. So yeah, I just have that there just in case sometimes I need to contract without doing everything else or I need to contract by a different amount of pixels that this one calls for. Um, so we're going to talk about this one now in more detail because I did talk about how it worked in the video, but I want to talk about um, kind of the reasons why I made the decisions in more in depth and I'll show you the code of how it works too. The basics of it is I select with the quick select tool the bubbles and then I click it and um, you can see actually how it works here. This is a good representation of how it works because I used a different color. So what it does is it uh, contracts the selection by five pixels. It then selects the paint bucket uh, and then clicks where my mouse is. Um, and uh, I used to have a thing where I would go just in the middle of the thing and click the paint bucket and then it would do that. But Photoshop is so weird about the paint bucket sometimes where if you click outside of a selection, it'll only, it'll only do the paint bucket for some of the selection. Um, sometimes if you're using a certain color, it doesn't do, it doesn't fill everything in, even though you're at the max tolerance. It's so strange. Um, so I, I negated the mouse movement part and I made it a little more dumb. It's basically just as fast. Um, so yeah, it contracts in and then it selects the paint bucket, clicks, uh, and that's why you have to have the, the color that you want to turn the bubbles into selected. So if I had selected white, let's go back to the setting. If I had white selected and then clicked it, then boom, they're gone and you have no idea because that's the bubbles are white. That's why it, it turned them to black, but that was a good representation of what's actually happening. Um, anyway, after the click, it hits Q again on my keyboard um, to turn it back to the quick select tool so I can go and do the rest of the page if there was overlapping bubbles or, uh, you know, just go on to the next page. I'll show you what the code does or what the code looks like here. This one I also wrote myself. Again, it's not complicated. It's just a, a macro. Th this was my mouse position stuff. I've commented it out because it was giving me too many bugs because of Photoshop. Um, but yeah, all it does is send uh, control alt C. That's my contract select command. It sends five. So it types five because I specifically like um, the uh, going five pixels in usually works for me. And then hits enter to do the contract select. Then G for the paint bucket. Um, I used to have a sleep thing. This was again for the, for the mouse movement, trying to fix the mouse movement stuff. Um, but now it just clicks. So it, it does paint bucket, click, and then Q is my quick select tool keyboard shortcut. Um, and then, oh yeah, this is one that I forgot. Control D. So control D, what control D does is it deselects things. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know if that's stock, but you know, if I have this selection here and I hit control D, it's going to deselect it. Uh, and that's helpful just, just so that I can, it, it just, it's something that I was already doing. Basically I was, I was analyzing when I was doing this by hand without the button and being like, okay, what did I just press? Write that down. What did I just press? Write that down. And, and I would get this complicated, uh, series of, of keyboard presses that I would do. And now I've consolidated them down into one button. I want to explain a little bit about why I have the contract select, because I don't know if I made it very clear in the video. Um, basically what I'm doing with the contract select, uh, the reason I'm doing that is to preserve the edges. So if we zoom way in here, um, you can see that when I did the quick select, you can see like right here, it, it got these pixels in there. It's got some of the pixels of the, the, the outline. Um, and it's just not, if I click on it, it's not very clean. It's got jagged, more jagged edges. But if I did my button that has the contract select, now they're super clean and it, um, See, this is the selection after the contract select. So it's only getting the text. The times that this has been the most helpful where I would have to do a lot of work that it's actually cut work out instead of just making things look nicer um, is whenever I have a thing with, let me, let me see if I can bring one up while I'm explaining this. Whenever I have a character who is talking with a black background instead of a 
uh, white one. We got Batman Who Laughs and um, turned Batman from the Batman Who Laughs series here. Uh, if I select them, and I'm going to hope that it doesn't just go off without a hitch this time, because sometimes it does. So those selections look pretty good. If I were to just paint bucket them without contract select, you can see... Oh, I hate this. They actually This actually worked beautifully. Oh, wait, no. Here's a good example. <laughs> it's hard to find, like, an example of, of negative things when you're looking for them. Um, so this looks terrible, right? Like, it's super alias and stuff. Uh, I, this is a tame example of, of how this works. Usually when you have red on black, it will just select the red as part of the bubble with the quick select tool. Like, it'll just get part of the thing in like that. So that's where contract select comes in handy. So if I were to press the button here instead, now you can see that it's a lot cleaner. You don't have those jaggy edges. Um, because it, but because look, the selection has nothing to do with the edge anymore. Um, so yeah, that is, that is why I have the, the contract select as part of that button. Okay, so for this last button here, the one with the like fast forward arrows that says 2.5x, this is something that, this is actually the most recent addition to this, um, which is also why it's in the bottom right. Well, that's not why. The reason why I'll get to in a second after I explain what it does, which I'm gonna do right now. What it does is um, it just speeds up Premiere's playback to 2.5 times speed, and if you, are an editor in Premiere who doesn't know that you can do that, you might be thinking, hey, you can't do that, um, but you can! To explain a little bit here, I have this podcast, this comic episode of Comics Experiment. Um, if you do the command that you can keyboard shortcut to whatever, I believe it's by default, it's set to L, but it's called shuttle forward. When you hit it, it, like it plays, but if you hit it again, <laughs> it speeds everything up. And so on and so on and so on. But it does it by uh, by two x increments, basically. So you know, one, then two it, times, like, four times, <laughs> eight, sixteen, and stuff like that. But if you want to go um, incrementally between that, you can. I don't remember what it's called. Um, but uh, let me let me see if I can bring it up here. I'm gonna reverse engineer this a little bit. We'll look at the code first, and then that'll remind me of what it's doing because this is an auto hotkey thing. It's at the bottom here. Um, so shuttle specific speeds. Um, yeah, so I have it bound to shift one, it looks like. That's an interesting, or no, that's L, that's L, right. So it's, uh, so that, that probably is a default command then. So if I go here, shift, it's called shuttle, shuttle slow, right? That doesn't make sense. It's not named correctly, but that is what it is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it basically, it, it does it in increments of like, 0.10 or something as opposed to the, the the multiples of two so i'm sending that a specific amount of time so i'm starting with 2x and then i'm this it's actually technically one two three four five six seven it's it's technically 2.7x but i thought 2.5x looked better on the on the thing so if i click that it immediately goes to 2.5x. My computer freaks out a bit just because it's like, ah, oh, it's going so fast, but then in like a few seconds, playback is normal again. Um, and I use this for podcasts just because um, two po I found 2.7 is the fastest I can go, I can listen without uh, not understanding what they're saying. Um, and this helps for um, podcast edits like this, where there's, as you can see, there's not a whole lot going on on top of just listening to it. Uh, so this just helps me work faster on that. Especially, again, when it's just a podcast where the video element isn't as important. I can just listen for my name if they're calling out an edit or uh, listen for a lull that I can cut out uh, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah. I don't do this on a lot of edits, but I will do this on on single camera podcast stuff like this where there's not a lot of visual element involved. But if there is a lot of visual, then usually I just do the, the double shuttle forward um, 2x speed. So yeah, that's the last button. Thanks. I hope uh, this was helpful in some way or gave you some ideas for touch portal commands or macros that you can make throughout a hotkey. I, I guess I'll put my code in the description if you want it. I'll just upload like my uh, thing to like paste bin or something, my editing scripts thing that I just have running at startup at all times. If you want to look through that, if you want to adopt any of, of the things that I have here, I'll put that in the description. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks for watching this, this very long, um, kind of relaxed video where I show off my touch portal stuff. Anyway, 
uh, I'll, I'll catch you on the on the flippity flop. See, bye. See you later.